As the president sounds off about holy babies born and unborn, we talk about the ongoing criminalization of women who happen to get pregnant. What's been the media's role, and have reporters done enough to make amends? We'll talk with Lynn Paltrow, one of the lawyers representing incarcerated mothers, media critic Janine Jackson, and Suzanne Sellers, who fell afoul of one of those laws in the 90s. Then, a drill down with Lynn Paltrow about the threats to Roe and more. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. It has been 46 years since the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade recognized that women have a right to privacy in health decisions, including pregnancy and abortion. It is a privacy right that even conservatives then endorsed. But a backlash followed, which asserted that the fetus has rights too. And over the years, fetal personhood, so-called, has gradually been written into law such that in some states, women are held criminally liable for the outcome of their pregnancies. Jail time for stillbirths? The conservatives on today's courts could make matters much, much worse. The media haven't helped. Scary stories about mythological crack babies and drug-addled moms played into the hands of the criminalizers. But as this year dawned, the New York Times published an extraordinary eight-part series on women's rights and even issued an apology. I guessed immediately that it had something to do with one of my favorite guests on this topic, and so it did. There is a story here, not just about preg- the pregnancy to prison pipeline, as we're calling it, but also how this important story migrated from the media's margins to the front page. To tell it, I am excited to welcome two friends, Lynn Paltrow, the founder and executive director of National Advocates for Pregnant Women, and my former colleague, Janine Jackson, program director at the Media Watch Group Fair and host producer of Fair's radio show, Counterspin. Joining us from Chicago in just a bit, we'll hear from one of the mothers featured in the Times article who found herself on the wrong side of one of these laws. But first, Lynn, congratulations. I mean, I can't remember the last time. I don't think it's ever happened that I've done a show about something great that happened in the media. But this really was great, wasn't it? How did it happen? Well, you know, people ask that. And sometimes they say, oh, who's your magical media person? But, you know, for 30 years, we've been trying to show people what the connections are, that you can't have... uh, things in little packages that don't spread. So the idea that you could outlaw abortion and not have it affect women or the status of women as full human beings um, is a hard one to explain. And we've been trying to do that. Recently, I was fortunate to get an op-ed in the New York Times about uh, what would happen if Roe went, and not just that abortion would be less available, but that women would go to jail, and that women are already going to jail, not just for having abortions, but for miscarriages and stillbirths, and not just for the outcome of their pregnancies, just for being pregnant and pregnancy turn certain things now into a crime. If you're pregnant, you fall down a flight of stairs. You're pregnant and you want to have a home birth. You're pregnant and you disagree with your doctor's advice and don't believe a cesarean surgery is necessary. That op-ed led to an invitation to speak to the editorial board and then another invitation to speak to the board. And I have to say that um, the New York Times has changed. Its editorial board is much more diverse than it has ever been before. And the members of that board really recognized that there was a much deeper story here and gave it the attention finally it deserved. So for people that didn't see it, and it's available in print as well as online, um, just talk us through a little bit. What was included in this in these eight parts? Some of them were editorials, right? They were all editorials, but written by journalists. So I was incredibly impressed by uh, many of the things that went even beyond what we and other people they spoke to um, had offered them. Um, it star- I, when I, we had been working and trying to provide information. We have a lot of data. We've collected documentation of the arrests of women for pregnancy, 1,200 since 1973 and growing, um, providing them introductions to clients and experts that we know. And they made use of all of them and went further. And gave you credit. Yes, and they did. But I was, we were all very anxious. What would this look like? What would it? And When the word came down that it was up and I opened it, I have to confess, I started to cry because when I saw that the title was A Woman's Rights, that it wasn't this like 
uh, reproductive rights or abortion rights, like this special interest. It's half of the human beings in the United States and everyone who has the capacity for pregnancy is implicated by the anti-abortion movement in this country. And plural rights. This idea that certain constitutional rights are owned by one side is absurd. It is about whether or not, and the New York Times did a beautiful job of capturing this, whether you can add fertilized eggs, because that's what they're really talking about now, fertilized eggs, embryos and fetuses to the Constitution without subtracting pregnant women. And there is no way. There's a ch it has to be a choice. If that gets recognized, then we are committing ourselves to a country in which the state has permission to control pregnant women. So not just women who want to end their pregnancy, not just abortion, plural on all fronts. Plural on all fronts. Ginny. The question, how significant is this? I mean, as I alluded to in the top, media have played a very active role and not usually helpful. Well, I, and I, I want to say I appreciate, as a media critic, I appreciate this package that the New York Times has done. I think it will definitely have an impact. It already is having an impact. I think it's long overdue. And I think it is commendably frank and sort of naming the names in media. Previous revisits, including at the Times, have said, Media went further than the research would have permitted. This actually, you know, lays the blame largely at media's feet when we're talking about particularly the narrative about crack babies. I would say, though, that I see it as a first step. I don't see it as a true reckoning because the crack baby narrative, the idea that there was something uniquely less than human about children that were exposed in utero to crack cocaine that did not apply to children exposed to powder cocaine or to alcohol or to cigarettes, that never should have passed a logic test. So for me, a true reckoning on media's part would involve them interrogating what it is about them mm. that led them to fall for it. Because we have to remember, the crack baby narrative isn't something that media picked up on and failed to scrutinize carefully, it's something media did. So let's just revisit that for a minute for people that weren't maybe reading the New York Times in the 1990s. I mean, they quote in this series one of their own reporters, Susan Shearer, who says, I would unwrite that article today if I could. It was part of the war on drugs that kind of moved into women's bodies and to some women's bodies. Well, and that's the important thing. You, it was not, and, and when you do look at what the research actually said, which again, you wouldn't have to go far to see that there was, even the original person they were citing, Ira Chasnoff, very quickly Don't said, me. this is being misinterpreted. I had a small study with 23 subjects. I did not mean this to be taken in the way that it's been taken. So why did it? Go so viral. Because I think it fed so many narratives. It fed into the war on drugs, as you say. It also fed into frank racism, you know, and desire to control not just any women's bodies, but black women's bodies, poor women's bodies. The Times series quotes this column by Washington Post columnist Charles Krauthammer, in which he says, um, we're talking about a bio underclass people whose biological inferiority is stamped at birth. Now, th this is huge, and this obviously is not science. This is narrative. This is editorial. And I, I appreciated the Time series quoting it. I wish they had gone on to say, though, that in that same column, Krauthammer went on to quote a guy, Douglas Besheroff, from the American mm. Enterprise Institute. And what he said was, this is not stuff that Head Start can fix. He said, we're talking about permanent brain damage, whether it is 5% or 15% of the black community, it is there. Yeah. So sit with that for a minute, you know, because we know that you cannot distinguish babies just by looking at them, you know, that were exposed to crack in utero. We're now saying maybe 15% of the black community need to be treated as though they are biologically inferior. So, you know, the repercussions, I think, are intense and, and, and you can't undo Just that. to re-describe the historic moment for a, mo yeah. a, sec a second, this is not just war on drugs, the incarceration, uh, mandatory sentencing period of the early 90s, but also welfare reform, exactly. the doing away with federal supports for women, poor women on welfare who were framed as, as people of color when it really wasn't the case. It was a very particular political moment with lots of ramifications, war on crime, getting tough, 
All of those things. Well, w one of the ways I put it to some journalists was, look, if they had come to you and said, there's a drug that white mothers are taking and it makes their babies stupid or it damages them and they're taking it anyway, would you have accepted that? Would you have reported it? Wouldn't you have interrogated that? But I think the, uh, the, the other piece of this is women and particularly white women don't have this awareness until, for example, they're trying to give birth and somebody's forcing them to have a cesarean surgery and they're not being listened to or threatening to arrest them if they don't come in for it. This country was founded on the idea that some people can totally control the lives and bodies yeah. of other people. And it keeps, it keeps happening and it should not be a surprise that it extends beyond black people. It extends to low-income rural women. Uh, it, it is part and parcel of our culture. We should say that we invited the Times to send a representative to discuss this with us, and, and I wish they had. Um, but in the absence of that, let's play a quick clip of one part of their reporting. Um, this is a, a video about a client of yours, actually. You want to introduce it? Uh, the woman's name is Ann Bynum, and I think she'll be telling her story, but it's an example of mass criminalization. She has a pregnancy. It is a stillbirth. There's no question about it. And yet the community wants to have her punished. And so they come up with their innumerable crimes to choose from. And in her case, it includes uh, concealing a birth uh, at a moment when she has gone to the hospital with uh, her stillbirth and they arrest her. All right, thanks to the New York Times. Check it out. When I woke up that morning, after I was aware enough to think, I drove myself to the emergency room with the remains in the front passenger seat. I came in. I said, I need to see someone. Gave birth last night and um, she didn't make it. They took the, the, the baby and were able to very quickly determine that it was a stillbirth. Several days later, the, the sheriff got me on the way home from the hospital, arrested me. They put handcuffs on me. They put me in the back of the police car. They said they were arresting me for concealing birth. Took me straight to jail and booked me. I thought, who am I arrested for concealing it from? My mom, my dad, my brothers? Who? It, it didn't seem to be that it was treated as a stillbirth. It seemed to be like it was being treated as a murder. How did the Times do, Janine? That's just a clip, but what did you make of it? Well, my first thought is the bravery of the woman um, to tell this story, which has to be very painful. I very much appreciate that the Times would, would do that and would spotlight her. But again, it's, it's down to the bravery of the women coming forward. And they've been trying to tell this for a long time. So I'm very happy that there's someone at the other end listening this time. Uh, I hope that that branches out and leads to trusting more women and listening to more women every day. Let's bring on one of the women who is profiled in the Times story. Her name is Suzanne Sellers, and she is now one of the organizers behind Families Organizing for Child Welfare Justice. Organizers and founders, I should say. Suzanne, welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. Hello, Laura. What was your experience uh, working with the Times on this story? It was exciting. I, I, I felt relieved. For 21 years, I've been trying to make my story public, uh, attempting to change public thought about the demonization of the crack mother during the 1990s. And this time series was groundbreaking. Mm. And it was very exciting for me. You, after the fact, <clears throat> wrote a letter to the Times. Uh, I in, did. In which you also apologized. Talk about that and remind our audience who haven't perhaps seen the story yet a little bit of your experience. Absolutely. Uh, the New York Times was gracious enough to invite me to be the feature of the fourth part of that series, A Woman's Right. And the, the title of my piece was Slandering the Unborn. And it was in my piece where the New York Times did apologize for its part it played as being a media partner demonizing crack mothers. When I wrote my letter to the editor in response to that article, I apologized for my role in being a crack mother. I have for many years 
been sad that I gave the New York Times and other media outlets something to report on. <laughs> Nobody wants to be a drug addict. I didn't wake up one morning and say, drug addict is my goal. It is a health issue. It was something that uh, was beyond my control. When I gave birth to my son, before I gave birth to him, I was tested for drugs without my knowledge or consent. So my takeaway is that you cannot accuse someone of wrongdoing and do wrong to them in the process. Mm. And that's w w the gist of my letter to the editor. That's what I wanted to say. Suzanne, I'm gonna ask everyone and I'll ask you too, but let's start with um, Lynn and then Janine. What do you want to happen next? Well, you know, no series as brilliant or wonderful or groundbreaking in the New York Times, uh, no, no series is gonna make an immediate change. I think it might help a very broad group of people understand that anti-abortion measures uh, affect everybody. And it includes expanding uh, the war on drugs to women's wombs. It includes expanding child welfare's uh, ability to control certain communities and people. Uh, that, that there is a much an opportunity for coming together across issues, drug policy reform, immigration, uh, dealing with mass incarceration and mass criminalization, people who are trying to make methadone treatment and buprenorphine, that we are all in this together. Mm. That what this series is about is that we treat health cares as criminal justice matters. They practice with the drug war. Now they're using it around pregnancy and all aspects of pregnancy, whether it's birth or uh, pregnancy loss or abortion. Uh, and I, I hope that it will discourage some of the misreporting that happens. And that's still really happening yeah. around the opioid epidemic. Janine, will we be seeing apologies decades to come around the coverage of opioid addiction now? You know, what I hope is that the lesson will be absorbed to some extent that apologies 10, 20, 30 years later are, are insufficient. And that what is required is that media actively interrogate what it is in their own processes that leaves them open to buying into stories like this. And what has changed, if you're going to deliver a mea culpa, I would like to, there to be some reckoning of what's different now so that this sort of thing would not happen again. When, even if it's not, maybe it's a facial recognition algorithm, maybe it's a criminal predictor, maybe it's not a drug. But these same biases and these same problems that led to this crack baby narrative being created and propagated still exist. And to you, Suzanne, you are organizing families for child yes, welfare justice. What do you want to yes, see on the organizing side and on the side of, of women like yourself? What I want to see on the organizing side is more people becoming involved in child welfare reform. Not only the people affected need to be involved, but society at, at large. What I also like to see is the, for the New York Times and other media outlets who participated in the demonization of mothers during the war on drugs, use that same power for good. Help us to reform the child welfare system and help us to repeal the Adoption and Save Families Act of 1997. Suzanne Sellers, Janine Jackson, Lynn Paltrow, thank you all. You can find out much more about this story and see my past interviews with Lynn on this topic and more at our website. That's lauraflanders.org. With a reactionary majority on the Supreme Court and a newly anti-choice president, what is in store for Roe v. Wade and women's rights across the board? With Lim Paltrow in studio, I took the opportunity to drill down. It's Roe v. Wade's 46th anniversary this year. What are we looking at? How are you looking at this situation? And what do we need to be talking about? Well, there are two parts. There's the part where there really is a risk that this court will overturn Roe v. Wade. On the other hand, there's an awful lot of terrible things that are happening, uh, even with Roe on the books. So there's a need for organizing and reframing and engaging in a serious discussion about what is a quality 
mean for half of the people in the United States who have the capacity for pregnancy. Reframing how? Well, we have, don't really have an agreed upon idea of whether we're calling it quality or fairness or dignity. But for example, you know, if we want to get health care for everybody, the first thing they're going to oppose, even if we got that far, is, oh, but not abortion and not contraception and not the health care half of the human beings need in the United States. And we have to get beyond that. The survival of the species depends on making sure that the people who can get pregnant can get the health care they need, whether it's respectful births, safe births. Uh, reduce the horrifying maternal mortality rates, particularly for black women. All of that has to be addressed, but we have to have some increased shared vision that equality means everybody, including the people who can get pregnant. And how do we understand the sort of ranks and what they believe, I mean, people on different sides? I mean, there are people, even in the discussion about fetal personhood and prosecuting women for what happens during their pregnancy, there are people that say, listen, we're just looking after babies. It's about child welfare. They make a case this is somehow well-intentioned and they don't actually want to be sending women to jail, let alone death. There is no way to give fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses or treat them as if they're completely separate and have really more rights than actual people who are born without establishing a permanent second-class status for pregnant women or women. So do people who are maybe Trump voters or Kavanaugh supporters or Neil Gorsuch supporters know that that's what they're signing up for? I really think they don't, or some may, and some actually feel that somebody who has an abortion is a murderer and should go to jail or have be put to death. Uh, but I think many more have believed the mythology that, oh, we're just going to punish the doctors, that we can criminalize abortion, we can outlaw abortion without making the women who have them outlaws. And that's just not how it works. And plus, once you do that, then any woman who does anything that is perceived as potentially causing the death of a fetus, as we see here and in El Salvador and around the world, then they too are criminals. Right here in New York City, there's a trial court that said the decision by Staten Island University Hospital to take custody of Renat Dre, appropriate her, and force her to have cesarean surgery, and in the process damage her bladder, that that was okay, or might be okay, because New York still has a self-abortion law, it's a criminal self-abortion law, and her refusal of cesarean surgery is tantamount to having an illegal abortion. We have health issues that people find difficult to deal with, and what we primarily do in this country is try to address them through the criminal law system, and what we need is a vibrant, uh, meaningful health care system where people feel safe and talking to their doctors, feel safe getting the advice, and knowing that they'll be respected. That's how you protect all children before they're born, before they're after. It's, we ha it's a continuum that requires the right kind of government engagement, which is not deciding you have to get locked up because you're not, because you might be miscarrying, and you have to undergo cesarean surgery, but what the government mm -hmm. does well, which is provide access to and the services people need. So all of us need to talk not just about the Supreme Court and Roe versus Wade, but a whole bigger picture than that. There were some folks interviewed on the front lines about what they actually think about abortion and what should happen to those who participate in abortions. This is what they said. Who captured the video? This is a group called ReproAction, uh, ReproAction.org, and they have a campaign called Stop Prosecuting Abortion. Operation Save America, an extreme national anti-abortion organization that has met with government officials, held a protest outside an abortion clinic in Milwaukee. Many protesters and speakers that day traveled from all over the country. We asked them their thoughts on women who have been sent to jail for self-managing their own abortions. So Pervy Patel served over a year in prison in Indiana for giving herself an abortion, is that right? Yes, absolutely. I live in Indiana. So you're familiar with that case? I am familiar that, with that case. I'm also familiar with the piece of legislation we have that will criminalize abortion. And you support that? Absolutely. Yeah. I petitioned for it. I campaigned for it. That's good. So do you think that the doctors should be going to jail? They should be executed. Yes. They should be executed. Yes, God's law. Is, should women be punished for not obeying God?
God? And the answer to the question is, is, is broader than that, but the, the short answer is yes. So do you think that women should go to jail? No. Do you think that women should go to jail? If they're choosing to kill a life, then yeah. And we don't want to see a woman suicide. If you don't want to see a woman suicidal, then how do you want to see her in jail? If she's committed a I mean, you would have a problem with someone who molested a child, right? You'd want to put them in jail, right? It is a sad, sick act. And it is a crime, and it's really sad, but I just want you to know you, Jesus loves you. And what about people who say that women should go to jail for having abortions? Do you think that's right? Women should get the death penalty for having abortions. No, women should not go to jail. The people that kill the baby should go to jail. The doctors, because they committed a murder. The women murdered, the yeah. women too, they, yeah. they are accomplices to murder. Yeah. They know it. And what we add to that is if Roe goes, Roe has given us uh, something to work with, because what Roe did, in addition to saying that abortion was protected, that abortion, you couldn't outlaw abortion, it said that at all stages of pregnancy, the woman is a full constitutional person and the fetus is not. Fancy that. From one constitutional person to another, thank you so much, Lynn Paltrow. You can find out more and see our entire conversation on this topic at our website.